Okay, thanks very much uh, for introducing me, inviting me, and for coming. Uh, lecture may be too much. It's more about what we call musings, some ideas, some reflections on what, what is going on. Uh, and what is going on is actually uh, talking about such a wide area. It's about borders. Uh, it is about from where we do we come and, and to where do we go? Uh, I'm coming from Munich, Germany, right? Um, at the same time, it's a question. I worked actually for about 20 years here in Ireland, down in Cork. Um, then I have been in Italy. I come back to some points later why I say this. I have been in China, where some of you may go, or at least studying that area. Um, and it's always about some borders, some time, defining spaces, defining relevances, defining references. And this is what is going on with this obo, with this one belt, one road. And at the same time what you saw or heard already, it's not new at all. It's going back in history, the Silk Road, nobody remembers because nobody had been born at that time when the Silk Road was relevant. When we talk about globalization today, it is all about this, what we have already for decades, for centuries. Some processes of, I say, rebordering. There have been always borders of different kinds, of different spaces. And at the same time, it was always about redefining these references. And as we are about redefining or looking for a framework, as I said, I come back to places like Italy, talking about this project today there is, I think, no better place to start than Bologna. Bologna in Italy, the first university, what we call today university, and it was a place with this contradiction of universal, universalization, globalization, if you want, and a strictly national project project. What happened in Bologna was, that's the second point, the building up a university by national students. They came to Bologna for whatever reason, from different places, from different countries, and had to establish something they felt to protect themselves, their own interests, business interests, against the national or the city government. So they gathered in nations, what they called nations, and said, we want to have our rights. And by the way, we set something up that is about teaching and learning. And by the way means we are doing this 
in terms of organizing professors or teachers or lecturers to teach us. Because we want to know what our rights are and we want to know what we can do with our rights. Canon law and Roman law have been the first subjects, core subjects of this university. It was getting things done, getting a framework within which we can um, organize our business. I come back a little bit to this business later, or actually no. There's another point of departure as well historically important. And this was something very strange, talking about digitalization today. It was a technical issue, actually two. The one was the telescope, not used anymore today, because we have other means. But the telescope was something like a supercomputer today. It was not possible to imagine what this supercomputer uh, would do in terms of the opportunities of exploring, of getting known to foreign places, the stars. <coughs> you could look at the stars, not just a little twinkling there, but you could explore this. And then there was another revolutionary thing, digitization. In the West, the invention of the printing press. Now this invention was a very complicated thing because actually it came from China. <coughs> it was known already. But it was a different system here. Baseline, it made the distribution of knowledge very easy. And the distributions means mass distribution far away from one click away. But if you look at the dimension of copying a book, hand copying a book, and having now the opportunity to reprint things multiple times and distribute them, this was amazing. This was amazing as it was amazing for us seeing the first computer and being able to do this mouse thing. Sometimes it works with the mouse. Not always. Another point in history, then we come again to something that is relevant today. Today they have different names. They have the name of Zuckerberg or Bill Gates or whatever. There have been a couple of people, probably the best known was Galileo Galileo, this huge inventor this innovator, now I have to disappoint, disappoint some of you, he was a gangster. Not really. But actually what he was doing is he was getting the telescope invented in the Netherlands, applying it and making business out of it. That was his idea. Making business out of it as well in terms of opening the world not to the stars, that was not yet the idea, but at least to travel from Spain to India. Okay, there was a little error in this calculation, he ended up in the Americas, uh, but, but these are details. It was really making it possible to calculate where you are going, including making mistakes, of course. As I said, Galileo was a little bit against him in terms of claiming something he didn't really invent. There had been Copernicus, there had been Kepler. There had been a global network, actually, of academics working on these things. I'm wondering, thinking about it, why Galileo was so outstanding, especially outstanding in a world that 
is full of people who are not really engaged in it. Kepler, to know about Kepler or Copernicus, you really, really have to understand what is important in terms of science. Galileo managed it in another way. Saying he was a gangster, there was another side to it. He was actually imprisoned. If you once stood in Florence looking from that place or the Tuscany, it's the most beautiful prison. But he was imprisoned, he was censored by the church. The old understanding of the world conflicting with the new understanding, being open. It's not just this little earth, world, planet that is the center of everything given by God, but it is our responsibility to do, to do something with it. He was imprisoned under very good conditions. Others had been kind of ignored and others burned on the stake. If you go to Rome, uh, Giordano Bruno, he has a monument there for his crimes. Galileo Galileo is another case interesting in this uh, respect. 1992, the Pope finally decided he was right. He was right. Actually, he did not tell any fantastic stories. This planet is not the center. It's a difficult story. They published a book. It's a beautiful book, actually. Just if you like nice books. Uh, I don't know how many thousand pages or hundred pages. Uh, it's, it's simply aesthetically a nice book. They rolled up the entire case. They did a huge procedure to say, yes, we, the church, have not been wrong. But he was right. So how is this possible? He was right in what he was saying, but we had been right according to that time. That time we had to think and we had to defend our position because this was too revolutionary. We couldn't cope with it. This is what we admit now as Catholic Church in 1992. So there is much stuff in this on digitization, on globalization. It is not the latest figures we are looking at in terms of international trade. Of course this is important. But you always have to look at, at the same time, at what does it mean? that so many goods, so many com uh, commodities are exchanged. You always have to look at the same time at per capita figures. Not only the GDP in terms of the overall trend. You have to look at the aggregates, okay, but you have to look as well at what does it actually mean for the people. And there are at least two sides. The one side is as consumer, and the other side is as producer. There's a third side to it, I'll come back to it later, which is actually the side of the distributor. How to communicate with these means and what to do with it. So we have the Lonya University printing press and telescope and this little gangster, Mr. Galileo. At the same time, or this can be translated, we have a small, a relatively small center where everything starts. If you talk today about university, we talked about it. even a small place like Maynooth has since 20 years a university. Interesting side remark, before it happened the priests, today it is the world that teaches. Hello. Second point, and this is a, we have to try to understand this. 
really understand it. It's, it's hugely difficult. We have this means of individualization. University giving you the right to study, to develop yourself, to avail of knowledge as individual. But it's only worthwhile to say this is what makes me not a special being, but that makes me part of society. I can read. It's amazing. Imagine. You can't read. I did this over the last two, two to three years. I couldn't read. A small part I could read. That had been the English, Italian, French, uh, German books. But if you live in China, most of the things, they may look nice. You know some Chinese. For me, it was just nothing. I couldn't read. I couldn't speak. These are social events. These are social constructs. And we have to be aware of it. Meaning, individual learning allows us to be part of society to develop our personality. Massification, printing press, it was not a nicely handwritten document. Everybody could read it. Not everybody. But many people could read it, could access it, go to the library. This was a huge thing. Like later the internet. Information, what do you need? Just tell me. If I'm logged in, two minutes, I have all the information that is there. If I know what it means, there's another question. But at least it is available. Massification, again, individualization. Enab enabling us as individuals to do something with it. That's my favorite. I think it's called drugs, sex, and crime. If you look at the scene then, those years and today, if you look about Facebook, Zuckerberg, and all these guys, it's like a criminal law. You read about exactly this, sex, drugs, and crime. People who don't, uh, who are not able to behave, to control themselves. Who, who just grab whatever they can grab. Who disrespect all rules, even if they know them. It doesn't matter. For me, they are not relevant, because I am standing here. Well, as I said, sometimes it's nice to read this kind of criminal novel. Sometimes it's really just disgusting what they are doing. But there we are talking about the, ba the baseline of it. It's power. It's the power. And there we come to this tricky thing of defining what actually power is. We have different definitions. We have the social, the sociological definition. We have the philosophical definition. We have the economic de definition. And we have a legal definition. For instance. But what it actually is about I'm never sure, quite sure, I have to say this for, 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 uh, as, as a apology. I'm, I'm never sure from where I'm arguing, because I have different backgrounds. So there is a little bit about economics in the strict sense. There is a little bit about philosophy and political science. What are we producing? And there, of course, as economists, I know what we are producing. It's called GDP. It's a very simple formula. This is what we are producing on the national level. It includes imports and exports, but this is what we are producing, goods, commodities. commodities. That is what is sold on the market and what is produced for the market. The rest, forget it. Whatever you do outside of this framework is not relevant. Still, the question, what are we producing? This is all. Here, 
here I'm teaching you, there are lecturers, they get paid for the job, or not, they get, this, this is a defined job, and then they talk to students afterwards. The lecture is part of the job, whatever they do afterwards is not part of the job, and even if you then meet in the evening in the pub and talk about the same stuff, forget it, it's not relevant. Still it is relevant because we are living with it. Meaning, what is valued? And how is it valued? It's easy to say as economist, there's a price tag, there's a wage, there's an income, that's the value of it. I'll talk about Friday a bit on, on the conference here. Of course this is the value in economic terms. But what do we value in encounters with people? We may value honesty, integrity, economically difficult to get it. I don't want to be personal, but I have my doubts with that this Uber, Uber uh, uh, boss is really an integral person. But still, he is valued in terms of market price or market value. That's the highest value. We are exchanging, we are communicating in economic terms and other terms with others. And this is something we do in different ways. We exchange, of course, as economists, I know how we communicate. We go to the market, which is the shop, and then others more advanced go to the stock market. They make millions and lose millions. You can't look as fast as they do it. This is communication. But at the same time, there is communication if you go to the little farmers markets around the corner and you talk about the apples you are allowed to sell and to buy or not. Because the EU has regulations in place strictly telling you what is tradable. And then you have the questions of, this is really then an economically important one, uh, especially then with uh, Obra, you have this point of where and when do we benefit from it. And there is basically a split in economics that says the one, you have to benefit in some way immediately. And that means everybody should get something out of it. Now. And the other is so-called trickle-down effect. Some people get rich. It's fine. It's not just. It's not nice. But it's fine. At some stage, we get the benefits out of it. If they make profit, they create jobs. If they create jobs, even if it's miserable jobs, we get something out of it. If there is permanently demand, then there is supply. If anybody considers to study economics, then we would enter the boring part in calculating the effects, multiplier effects, and, and, and. Here it is important to get the, the basic idea of two ways of dealing with it. Trickle down the one, immediate effect the other. Now, I leave the economic side, I think, although I would say there is a certain heterodox uh, understanding of economics. It is get, getting into the mainstream, the last, I think, the na last Nobel Prize was giving for behavioral economics. People are not rational beings. This is what we always learn in the textbook of economics. 
people exactly calculate. It's called opportunity cost. Exactly calculate what they do, what they get out of it, and if it is beneficial, if it pays out. When did you start today here with the seminars? Eight o'clock? Nine o'clock? Nine o'clock is for Irish. Did anybody turn up at half past nine or ten? It was great to sleep, wasn't it? It was great to go through the world. Sun was shining. You, you don't calculate it. You, you just do it. You think, I'm not up to this stupid lecture. I have to, to get my mind clear. There was something. I know I should get to the lecture. I should learn this for the exams. And I have to know it. But I have to get a hold of my life. I have some other problems that don't go into the calculation. There are so many behavioral things. And there are so many things that change over our lifetime, digitization, and that change with personal experience. I'm originally German, left that country I don't know when, lived about 20 years in Ireland, in and out, meaning I had been in the meantime then in Australia and doesn't matter really. Then I lived in Bella Roma, Bella Italia, this beautiful country, old, you still respect the ancient tradition. Don't build a metro in Rome, where they built one. But to build an additional line is hugely difficult. Because as soon as they start, they make a plan, that's an easy one. Then they start digging and find a stone. Hang on, that could be one very old ancient stone. Oh, stop, no building, no building. We have to stop this, an ancient stone. We have to investigate this. It's not possible to build a metro because it is actually an ancient stone. We have enough ancient stones in Rome. But still, this has to be protected. These are rules, unwritten rules, of respect, of not calculating, of respecting some lifestyles, some traditions, but as well of the way of in, in which we are then living together. I forgot then after Rome I moved to, to China. Again, something you are not respecting other people, older people, younger people more in another country than in another, in one country than in another. But you are doing it in, in, in different ways. You are respecting traditions of the country, but at the same time, if these traditions are different, you have to find a different way of, of, of respecting them. Being brought up, never buying into it in a Christian environment, this is, of course, closer to me, even in understanding what they mean, than Buddhism, than the pagan traditions in Latin America. This is something we cannot, sometimes we cannot understand. As simple as that. I'm working now in this law institute. There are some terms. I asked, actually, before coming here for another thing, I asked, can you translate this? No. It's a German law tradition. You cannot simply translate it. So what you do is you find some way of translation and then add the German word. If anybody knows German, try to translate common law. No. Forget it. It's another concept, common law tradition in England and in America. We don't have any Roman law. So it is extremely difficult even to find a term. 
And then, of course, you have from there the entire thinking in social science of two principles, methodological principles. The one is methodological <coughs> individualism. It's me, it's you, it's you, it's you, it's everybody for him or herself who counts. That's the Western social science. And then we put them together, and what we have afterwards, that's, that is society. Afterwards, methodological individualism. And then we have methodological nationalism. Nobody came up with this and said, no, we have to think methodologically nationalism. But what we have, and I admit for me it's sometimes a little bit annoying, although I can understand it, it's we in Ireland, we in Germany, we in China, we in, I don't know there. We are so special. We are so special in being very good, having the best, I don't know what, the best rain in Ireland, okay. That's the frequent, actually it is really good Irish rain. Um, and I, I arrived yesterday at the airport, I thought, right, this is Ireland. An old guy talking to me, chatting to me, and I thought, yes, it is a beautiful country. Why did you leave? And then we have other things, just the opposite. Oh, no. This health system, the taxation, the I don't know what. This is Ireland. I don't want to have it. Look at the other countries, they can do it. They can do it better. But we in Ireland, we in Germany, we in France, we can't. Of course there is this thing. We all live in our nations. But at the same time, we don't. We have some problems. And in order to solve them, or at least to, to contribute long term to some solution, we have to overcome this. Digitization. I found it, living in China, amazing how much in certain parts of the population, Chinese population, it is so common. And from my impression, being back now since half a year something in Europe, uh, I never found it to this extent. The, the, the commonality of using computers, meaning these little computers, handhelds, also called mobile phones, smartphones. These are computers. You use them for everything. How to get to Dublin? From menus. There's actually this voice activation now, which whenever you have. Hey there, can you help me? I have to go to Dublin airport. Yes, of course. How do you want to go? Bus, public transport. You have communication with these things. You pay. And before you ask this thing, where do I get what I want? If you don't want, if you don't, this is the, 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 the really interesting thing. If you don't want, know what you want, this thing tells you what you want. Amazon has a patent on this. It's called predictive shopping. It's actually al already relatively old. It's three years, I think. Predictive shopping is there is somebody standing at your door, the bell rings, and she said, actually, I have a color TV for you. But, but I, I didn't order a color TV. Mm, that's right. But, but still, I have it here. It's, it's for you. Well, actually, you can leave it here. I think I need a new one anyway. That's basically predictive uh, shipping. It's the next step after Amazon. You buy this and that book. You buy this and that good commodity. And then, actually, customers who bought this already bought this as well. Perhaps you're interested. Ah, one click away. This is very common, in my experience, amongst as I said, part of the uh, Chinese younger generation. 
younger, now you may smile, but these are the 40, 45 years. They are pretty used to it in their daily life. Now, if, if you go to details, it's very difficult again to figure out what it means. There is a, on, on the one hand, if you open the, the newspapers uh, on China, Chinese economy, it's going down from 6.8% to 6.5%. Europe would be proud and glad to have it, but that's another story. Uh, but there is a problem, in a way, a problem with the internet. People go to shops, go back to shops. Okay, these are details. But there is, in general, at least this trend. You book your Uber card to go to the restaurant so-and-so, which is already booked, and then they have everything there, and you get, in the meantime, your shop shopping delivered uh, predictively to, to your refrigerator. It's amazing, isn't it? I, I think it is amazing. You don't have to think. What do I actually need? Getting a little piece of paper, write down milk, eggs, bread. No, I think there's bread in the refrigerator. No, I, I skip that. You don't have to. The, the, the fridge knows it. And the fridge knows everything. The fridge knows. Actually, if you have been there for your meal, you probably want to go to that bar afterwards. And your friends are actually over there. Don't go to that bar where you usually go, but go to your friends. It's amazing. I really think it's amazing. Now, there are two things I want to come with which I want to come to an end. The one is this amazing thing of such a shift. Now, I'll come back to the printing press. The printing press had been termed, classified, as a shift from internal to external intelligence. People had to think, had to write, and then they stored it on the little paper, and that was it. External intelligence, it's a McKinsey report. External intelligence he means it's not here. I don't depend on you. You don't depend on me. It's in a book. You can refer to the book. Where are you standing? Go, read the books. It's there. Externalization of intelligence. But at the same time, of course, I have to say with being a lecturer and liking this job, I have to say, actually, you don't have to read my books. You have to listen to me. We have possibly to engage afterwards in a discussion. We, we stay over together to, for, for one year. We have the opportunity to develop things. And you can actually change my opinion. And I can change yours. But it's not so much about changing the opinion, but changing the thinking and changing the basis to do something together. Because what we do today, not building or destroying the European Union or trying to build up a, 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 a one belt, one road project, is exactly this. Trying to create, co-create the future. And there is the second thing of now I read it. Now we have a second shift from internal to external, that of intelligence. It's called artificial intelligence. Machines think for you. Predictive shopping. Predictive whatsoever. Predictive driving. The car drives for you. There's nobody sitting in the car. The car, even you don't have to tell the car anymore where you want to drive, but the car knows it. Hugely intelligence, artificial intelligence. 
Okay, there was a problem. Recently, a car crashed, and in fact, so-called fatal accident. Do you know how many accidents happened, occurred on the roads every day in Ireland over the last year? I'm not, I don't want to be cynical. It's a very sad and tragic event. But one person, it's nothing. While I give the lecture, there are several dead toys on the Irish road, definitely on the Europeans. So we have this problem now, artificial intelligence. We externalize intelligence. We give responsibility away. We have problems with this. Of course we have problems with it. Do you know the problems of the horses in 18, I don't know when? They had to work. You don't find any horse today anymore working. Leontief got a Nobel Prize, actually, for saying this. Well, it was not as simple as that. But he said that the, the horses, working horses, had been extinguished by not being needed anymore for fun. They had been, there, there was one problem. They didn't have a trade union, the horses. If they would have a trade union, have had a trade union, they would still be in business. <laughs> it's a five pages, eight pages thing. So this is one problem. The other is the invention of the car. Nobody uses the bicycle, nobody walks anymore. giving not intelligence, but giving leg power, energy away. Now, this is not the really the core of it. The core of all these processes is that we reshape our existence. Before the invention of the car, and especially Mr. Ford, you can walk, you could walk around, and there was nothing. Stupid horse, perhaps, but they just had been on the way to be extinguished. Th there was no danger. These had been public spaces, really public spaces. Now, you have had a separation. Of this is for the car, this is for the high-speed car, this is for the low speed in the city, and this is for walking. A separation, a segregation of life. Public, private, but as well, coming back to this question, what, what do we produce? We produce high-speed transport from A to B and forget the people who, ha who are chasing it, who cannot live anymore, at least not their old traditional life. I don't want to say that this old traditional life was the best life one could lead. But this is what we have to be aware of when today, with all the problems, we have this project of Obwa. There had been an article, I don't know if anybody read it, uh, distributed, there are huge problems with the political uh, understanding or assessment of this. And of course it is China who took the initiative and says we want to take up an old idea of the Silk Road and rebuild it. The old idea of the Silk Road, I experienced it once in Firenze, in one of the uh, palaces of the Medici. It was a beautiful and highly elitist project. If you go to one of the palaces, or if you go to the palaces uh, of the Medici, the leading classes then, you see most beautiful things from China. Ordinary people, if they had, if, if they did get something to eat, they had been happy. But it was as well, and this was decisive, of course an economic interest, a power elite being in contact. But at the same time, it was people. Never forget these Elijah up here, these are people. And they have been exchanging ideas, they have been exchanging plans, how to exploit the classes, 
and energy. But they happen to change with more than goods, more than commodities. Opening a space, and this is what the ambivalence is about of the internet and digitization, you have all these opportunities. One click away. You can do so many things with it, exploring things and making something for the future. But at the same time, and this is discussed today, what it is about, and this will be a long discussion, not, dip, not least depending as well on the West, of those critically observing it, with good reasons to be critical about it. Is it simply a trade route? Is it a new industrial belt? Or is it as well a space for communication? And communication in this widest sense. And there I said something earlier on, saying I could, we will come back to this. We have traditionally the measurement of GDP as products, as commodities being sold on the market, which still is important. All the goods we have, all the, the, the commodities we have. At the same time, with digitization, we have a huge shift. I don't know the answer what it means, but we have a huge shift towards distribution. Information exchange, knowledge, ex knowledge ex exchange. Uh, this is playing a role. It's not just the car you produce, but it is actually not so important, the car. Google is interested in producing cars, more than Mercedes-Benz of itself. So this is something that is a challenge for this over, to integrate in a wider sense, to say what we are building up is not simply a transfer mechanism, but it is something that is there for whatever it is and will be people's life. Finale, Maynooth campus. If you walk across the campus, you see these little posters or flags. I don't know if anybody saw it. Actually. Your future knows no bounds. Your curiosity knows no bounds. Your exploration knows no bounds. And the same as with your research. 20 years, University of Maynooth, uh, 97 to 2017. My question to the University, to Obra, to the European Union, and whatever you talk about when you talk about globalization and bringing things together with a new means of technical support, which are huge, which can be a danger in terms of getting independent. My question is still, do your goals, do your aims, do your visions actually have a, a bond? Is there anything where you say, this is why I am doing it? And this is, I think, a major challenge for the entire digitization. Doing things simply because they are seemingly possible. For whatever sake, there is no point. That's my latest thing uh, I, I read the other day. Eternal life. There is no bond. For what? I don't want to die now, but at least I know at some stage it's enough with life and with this lecture. So thanks very much and much your questions.
So just one quick comment uh, for Professor Ashman's presentation. It's very inspiring, uh, especially the you mentioned. What are we producing as human beings? What are we chasing? GDP or creating more jobs or what? what what's the whole purpose of this I mean, production? Uh, you mentioned about the, the refrigerator that can, a clever, smart refrigerator, prepare everything for us. We don't need to think. The AI will think on behalf of us. So we don't need to choose a restaurant. The AI will tell me, yeah, that's the restaurant you may like, 80%. And, and they can identify where are my friends. And they will notify me, here is the place you should go 8 o'clock in the evening because your friends are there and that's the, your favorite part. Uh, but do you think there is a danger behind this? It's linked to what we are producing now. Is that uh, we are creating this new digitalizing lifestyle while in the end it's not we ourselves making a decision but it's the AI who learned our behaviors first and then eventually they began to lead our, our behaviors just like the refrigerator you like chips you like tea so i prepare it for you it, it's already delivered in the end uh, i think it will be smart enough to do that you don't need to go out to shopping everything will be delivered but do you think there's a danger behind this that yes we're producing all these commodities we're producing this ai ai feeds us in the end and in the end it's that we lost our uh, uh, passion or our uh, uh, will to explore either the world outside world or explore our own self our own soul because we, we, we already get used to this feeling that everything is in front of you the AI do it for you the robots get it for you the car drives for drives for you you sit on the car and you don't need to give it a destination the car knows where you want to go maybe today we close day. But, but, but in the end, what's the purpose of this commodity? What's the purpose of this production? Uh, is it a danger that we will we'll be, as a human being, we we'll kind of be, become, kind of, we produce this thing and in the end we were not controlled, but uh, became a kind of, you know, began to follow the AI that we've created or become less motivated to exchange our ideas with other people with real people and uh, and to share our knowledge to share like you said the silk road to share the beauty of other cultures of other civilizations and in the end we were trapped in this ai thing well i, I don't want to disappoint you now but if, if you would have the name mr kurzweil you probably would have earned five million dollars or something with this uh, because he speaks now, he speaks a little bit more elaborated on it in technical terms. He speaks about singularity, and the singu singularity principle is exactly this: we we merge with the machine, we merge with this artificial intelligence, and we don't exist anymore. In in this way, we, we don't decide because our decision is actually part of this machine decision, and I I I. I absolutely see this danger because technically it is of course much more adv uh, advanced as it has been at the same time this kind of warning encouraging you but well not not regarding the five million but uh, in, in terms of thinking it opens ways for us uh, we, we, we can use these things uh, for, for most beautiful experiences I'm, I'm kind of uh, hesitant to say this, especially here and now. Um, we have had in China, the idea was that there was a bag and every student would put the telephone into it uh, and concentrate on the lecture. Because it was so overdone and we as lecturers complained actually about it, do something, stop this now. When we talked about it, it was no, no use in that. So nobody put the telephone <coughs> into it. Uh, but at some stage, I actually lectured and was walking around and said, Just, okay, I can talk while I'm doing this. Uh, this is the one thing. You can explore things. And this is as well this, 
externalization of intelligence. I don't know if it is intelligence that is externalized. Intelligence is here. Extent, in, intelligence is from, from interaction. Intelligence is not from merging with the machine, but from gaining independence from the machine, from certain necessary decisions. And this is something, the one, we use it. We, we are not running around like individualist idiots who are not talking to each other, but only talking to this one. This is a means of socialization as well. If it's in the wrong hands, be it under the title WhatsApp or uh, uh, Kakao Talk, the Korean Japanese one or the, the WeChat one, that doesn't matter. If it's in the wrong hands, and that's our hands not least, it is a danger. At the same time, another warning from the other side. When I had been a little bit younger, my parents always said, we always did this this way. Why should we change? There's no point. We always slept you. There's nothing wrong in slapping children. We got old as well. It wasn't bad. We have some success. So we, we never change. And this is, of course, a, a, a kind of general da danger. Uh, with the, if you want to have an, an exponential growth, that these things make <coughs> damned lazy. Because I don't have to ask, where do I go to the main street in Maynooth? But I just go to Google or whichever, and it tells me not only where it is, but it says 100 meter to the left. Whichever language you want. You don't even have to learn the language anymore. Which means as well, if you talk to people then, they are working on this, but still, if you go to people, it translates for you. I don't know if you ever used Google Translate. There's another one, it's a called Deep, Deep Translate, I think. It's much better than Google. Sometimes it's perfect. And sometimes you're standing there and you say, what does that mean? What is it talking about? Coming back to these terms of common law or Leistungserbringungsverpflichtung, that, that, that cannot be translated. You have to understand the system. Let's wait another hundred years and talk about it again. Perhaps we succeeded to control the machines and keep in control. Perhaps we ended up with singularity, eternal life of nonsense. Oh, oh, oh.